Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Central Texas Life, the podcast. And it is a joy to welcome Ollie Pettigrew to the podcast. You are that Englishman in Texas. Yep, there you go. It's that Englishman. There's only one of us, and it's me. That's right. It would be you. (laughs) But you know what? In the last two weeks, I have interviewed two British citizens who were born in Hong Kong. Really? In Waco, Texas. That's unbelievably peculiar you're kidding yeah, yes right, right. danny howard who is a composer she was here in waco with her husband uh, pablo urbina who was one of our conductor finalists for the waco symphony they sat right there and she told me about life in hong kong and then here you are two weeks later that's wild born in hong kong that's but you right. were reared in england sort of yeah i uh, i was born in hong kong i moved when i was five yeah um to the uk and then i sort of finished school up until 18, living in the southeast of England. Um, I went through sort of prep school and then I went to boarding school. And then on my gap year, at that point, my parents had actually moved back to Texas. So I finished off boarding school living in a small apartment nearby. And then I went back to Hong Kong. And so total, really, in my life, I think 25 years in Asia, about 12 years in the UK. And now we're approaching 10 years in America, which is crazy because I still feel like I just got here. Well, and you, you look like you're about 15 years old. So I don't know... <laughs> I don't know how you pack all that oh, in. You should have seen me a few years ago. This, I've had a baby face my whole life. To this young life. Well, it is so exciting to talk to you. We met at an unlikely place, I guess, but it's a happening hip place now. It's called Steak Lassie Waco. And, of course, I've had Jacob and Dave Ennis, the fabulous uh, pianist, who yeah. uh, does his his little thing there on Thursday evenings. We met and kind of place you like to frequent with your wife. It is, yeah. It's a great place. I was just, you know, the thing about it is, I mean, I've been coming to Waco for 17 years and, you know, I've been married to my missus for 15. And I just remember when the only thing you could find downtown in Waco was parking because there was nothing to do. Yeah. You know, it was just a bunch of abandoned buildings. And now, I mean, in the last five years, the sort of glow up that Waco's got and the fact that I can go to a bar that's got a speakeasy in the back and it's got that kind of New York feel almost. It does. It's wild to me. Yeah, it does. And you are the consummate jet setter. I mean, you have lived all over the world. You've yeah. traveled all over the world with your work. Let's talk about your work. I mean, you have packed a lot in your young life when it comes professionally yeah. because of all the shows you have done. Yeah, it was very lucky, actually. Um, I On that gap year I was talking about when I went to Hong Kong, my mom just basically pushed me into going into a modeling agency. Mm-hmm. Um that was on a Monday. My first because she says my kid is so cute. Yeah, just, you gotta get, you gotta sign him up. Um, <laughs> but then on Wednesday was my first casting, and I remember it being hilarious because you know there was all these models around, and I didn't really know what to do. And I got up in front of the camera, and the guy goes, "Okay, pose." And I went <laughs> like this, and nobody <laughs> laughed. And I was like, everyone looked at me weird. But that being said, booked the job, and Friday was my first shoot. So in that year, suddenly I got into sort of shoots, and then I had billboards, and then I even appeared in a movie. I was a bad guy in a movie. Kurt's Henchman number three. Really? Gen Y Cops. You can find it on Amazon Prime. You won't even notice me. But Paul Rudd, who plays Ant-Man mm-hmm. in the MCU, he's the good guy. I think he shot me with a sniper rifle in that oh my movie. Gosh. So at 18 years old, I'm like, well, this is a fun way to make money. No so kidding. once I was really sort of, I was spending sort of four months, five months a year at college in uni in the UK. But whenever I wasn't at uni, I was back in Asia and I was just kind of modeling here or there. And then it was when I was at 23, uh, I visited Singapore for two weeks uh, and left 12 years later with a wife and two kids in a career. Yeah, you're a very, very big deal yeah, it's, in um, Singapore. Well, yeah, I got into it. There's The thing about Asia is it works a little bit differently in America, but all of the international TV at the time um, was being made sort of primarily out of Singapore or Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't actually sort of working any like specifically local Asian. I was working 
for Sony, but Asia and Food Network Asia, HBO Asia, Cinemax Asia. And so once I got into TV, there was kind of like, um, there wasn't a lot of great, like, hosts at the time. I was watching TV and I go, man, I could do better than that. And I'm just a model. And so, um, you know, when I was modeling, I started doing TV commercials. And then these production companies that made these TV commercials, they started getting into making um, television shows. And they just remembered this model that never shut up. And I was like, <laughs> people were like, you should do that for a job. And I'm like, oh, OK, I'll give that a go. And so I had um, until September of last year, um, I think the first show I did, I think, was the World Cup 2006. And I went from one show to the next show to the next show to the next show to the next show, the next show for 16 straight years. Well, so, no, one one year you were doing like six shows at a time or yeah. something. I don't know how you did all that. Yeah, neither do I, actually, in retrospect, when I think about it. But um, it was very much a feast and famine kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so all the productions would kind of get pushed towards the end of the year. And, yeah, I got one job and then they called their buddy... And so, I, yeah, I started off on uh, Cybermax on, on AXN and uh, then they called their friend and suddenly I was on Lonely Planet and then they called their boyfriend and suddenly I was on HBO Cinemax mm -hmm. and just it, all, it was all kind of word of mouth. And, um, and that, I just that kind is of, just a magical career. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you really find you're a most unusual dude in <laughs> being able to, to do this or do you know of other people? Oh, yeah, well, you know, Joe over there, he was just well, picked was, up here and there and... It was, I mean, I was one of those kids that w people always said, oh, you should do television, you know, because I was always just, you know, there was a You're camera. You're very natural. And I was I performing in front of it. I think that's what the camera loves. I, oh, I think that's that's actually my key to, to TV hosting, that I'd advise other people that are thinking about getting into it. And I think the biggest tip to anybody, even if you're going to do content creation or podcasting or anything, mm -hmm. uh, is just to be authentic, to be 100% yourself. And I think the biggest tip I said is don't try and be cool. Yeah. Uh, no, we right. will, you know, the old broadcaster. You, you'd see people, you know, they go out <laughs> and they do television and they, they just try to, to be cool. Or you see people over hosting and they're yeah. just like, oh, we're here at the Oscars. And I'm like, that's not how a human being talks. No. So I think I, you know, I'd go off on these adventures, these things with Lonely Planet and with Food Network. And I would have to do these really incredibly fun or scary things. I'm cl climbing without ropes or I'm eating octopus or I'm like, you know, doing all these things. The worst thing you ever did? Uh, oh, mate, that's the well, thing is, I'd never say any of it was bad because this right. is my point is that if you're scared to be scared, if you're nervous, right. be nervous and right. communicate that with the audience. And I, I because started, they're feeling the same thing for you. Exactly. <laughs> they, you are experiencing something and they are vicariously experiencing exactly. it through you. And if you just yeah. do it casually, then no one cares. But um, some of the hardest stuff I've done, I mean, uh, some of the physical challenges. Yeah. Um, when I was on right this minute, I was doing a video about uh, Red Bull and they had this thing called the Red Bull 400. <gasps> which is uh, the hardest 400 meter race in the world. You run yeah. the wrong way up an Olympic ski jump. And so Red Bull saw that and they go, cool, do you want to come to Park City and do it? And I was like, yeah. But I mean, I trained for that. I They invited me along with a bunch of CrossFitters and stuff. I was the least fit person there and I was in pretty good shape then. Yeah. And uh, oh, I slept for 14 hours the next day. Did you? Just I couldn't get out of bed in the hotel. I just lay there completely drained. It was absolutely incredible at the same time though but that's yeah that's a that was probably the hardest thing i had to do but i've done a yeah. lot of weird and scary things yeah eating strange things yeah you well, mentioned octopus that's right well i was doing something for food network mm -hmm. and uh, i they have a very traditional breakfast where they just eat you pull a <laughs> pull an octopus out of the water and that's it that's how you prepare it but for me they at least cut <laughs> it up um so it gets cut up into like a hundred pieces and i always describe it as people as like imagine if it's something from a sci-fi movie or Star Trek. Oh. Because they put this bowl down in front of you and it's all in a hundred pieces, but it keeps moving. But it's still moving, For yeah. like another 30 minutes. And so, oh, you know, the thing about it is, is you kind of want to get it done quickly, but if you don't chew it properly, because the suckers still work, they'll wrap around your finger. They're sticking in your yep. throat. So yeah, if you they're like, oh, Ollie, if you don't chew this properly, you'll, you'll choke to death. And I'm like, Cool. That's not a good thing. No, no. <laughs> Thanks, guys. But that bit of TV <laughs> Not the is, way I want to go, really. That bit of TV is what got me into America, though. So, so okay. Food Network did that. They showed it at this thing called Real Screen in the US. I didn't even know this was happening. Um, it's just basically like um, a conference for all of the television networks and production mm -hmm. companies in LA over a few days. And I was in Singapore, and I wake up the next day, and I've got an inbox full of production companies uh, and, and agents and people like this just going, who are you and why don't we know who you are? And so that was one of those people chased me for two years until I came out to the States. When I came out to the States, I got my agent, then I moved here. And then my first casting was right this minute. So that was that was my whole thing was it took me uh, 11 days after my green card came in to, to book a job. But uh, it took 
nearly 18 months to get that green card. So it was a slow... It's a slow process. Yeah, it's a nightmare. I yeah. I can tell you from the guy that's been on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. And I was a gold standard. They said, Ollie... Exactly. I mean, the kind of guy years. we want to come here. You've got yeah. two kids. You know, you're, you're, you're successful in what you do. And like, yeah. right, it'll still take you 18 months and a bunch of money. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Nightmare. Yeah. But I got it here. I mean, that's the thing. I still feel like it's been six months and it's nine years now almost. Which is wild. So how long here in Central Texas? So Central Texas, I actually, you know, I came here nine years ago. This is where we were. And it was, of course, right after my wife and I buy a house um, in Lorena. Mm-hmm. So we have this uh, this house and I booked right this minute, like six weeks later. So I enjoyed about six weeks. And then they said, cool, can you move to Phoenix in nine days? I'm like, I guess I'm moving to Phoenix. So I did two years where I was flying 100 times a year. Oh, man. Yeah, so about a 1,000 miles each fun. way. It wasn't. I mean, but the thing is, I wanted to get in the U.S. market. This is what I wanted to do. I was yeah. working on national television. It's like you do what you need to do. And so, yeah, I, I'd sort of I'd leave the studio on a Friday evening. I'd jump on the sort of uh, an 8, 9 o'clock flight. I'd land at Dallas at about 1 in the morning. My wife would come pick me up. We'd drive the two hours back to Lorena. We'd have a quick glass of wine and catch up. And then I basically had like a day and a half you know, with the family at the house. And then three o'clock in the morning, uh, two o'clock in the morning on a Monday, we'd get up, we'd drive to Dallas. Mm. I'd take the flight back to Phoenix. I'd get off the plane, go straight to studio and then shoot, shoot Monday. And so, you know, it was a tough couple of years. It lasted about two and a half years before I said, guys, because the show kept continuing. We know. need to go. We need yeah. to move. Yeah. So they moved out and we did six years in, in, in Arizona. So it's only mm-hmm. really since the show ended. Did you keep your house here? Yes. Yeah, so oh, we, we okay, leased good. it yeah, while yeah. we were gone. Smart. So it worked out really nicely in the end. Yeah, um, the, yeah Phoenix though. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. climate wise. Yeah, it's six. It's, uh, it's how, a dry heat. Look how pale I am. All right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I, I six months of the year I didn't leave the house. You know, yeah. so it was just it's. You do get used to it, I promise. Like after like the third or fourth year, you you sure you feel it. It's 120 degrees, you feel yeah, it. Yeah. But it wasn't quite as oppressive as it was. And then, funnily enough, you know, we'd fly back here and it'd be cooler, but it's so much more humid. Oh, that's and you're right. Like, oh my god. Yeah, thank I, I how don't do people a, do this? How do they live here? You know, I can't breathe. No, I know. Yeah. But, so, but you wanted to come to the states. I think I read because it was just so expensive. Well, where you were. Yeah. There's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, really. Um, you know, one, it's like if you're in television, the U.S. is the biggest market. So, yeah. you know, while I had definitely, you know, conquered the Asian market and I'd had, I mean, 14 television shows or something like that and, you know, six at the same time, two on the same network, back to Unbelievable. back. Unbelievable. You know, that I was like, all right, well, I, well, let's go and see if I can mix it up with the, the big boys. Turns out I could, which was a nice mm-hmm. thing for me. But also, yeah, Singapore was a place where the pay was low and the cost of living was extremely high. So, mm. I mean, our um, monthly expenses was uh, 20000 <gasps> Yeah. Like, um, wow. I, the way I boil it down for people is like, you know, what do you say? A Toyota Prius off the lot in America costs about $35,000 or something mm-hmm. like that. That same vehicle off the lot in Singapore is $150,000. And the reason is? Well, the reason is many things. Um, it's just it's the most expensive place in the world to live. Uh, they don't want people to drive. Mm. So well, That's a good way to keep them from it. It is because they've got the best integrated transport system in the world. They've got thousands of buses, tens of thousands of, right. tri- of um, taxis, and they've got incredible train lines that mm-hmm. go anywhere. So you honestly don't need a car. I didn't get a car in Singapore until the time that I had two kids going to two different schools. Yeah. And so we were spending so much money on taxis to do that that it was actually cheaper. But... Yeah, it got to the point where my, my missus sort of ran the numbers and she just put it down in front of me. And she goes, Ollie, you need to make a quarter of a million dollars a year to make nothing. That's zero. Just a break even. Yeah, that's where we then start making money. And, you know, it was, Asia was just a completely different way because television was great and they certainly made you feel famous. And I got to go to the premieres and be dressed and go to the Gucci place and pick out what I wanted to wear Fun. and front yeah. row of the fashion shows and all these sort of things and the meet the celebs and everything else in between. Um but they honestly didn't really pay you any money. It was terrible. You you made your money by doing live events. You got famous enough that other people hired you to get on stage. And that's where you could make your, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit of extra cash. So, you know, when we came out here, we bought the house in the arena and three and a half acres for less than a Toyota Prius cost in Singapore. So, <laughs> and at that point, you know, it kind of made sense. This this makes sense. Well, so you were a huge hit here stateside with a wonderful show. And I was just sharing with you earlier uh, at KXXV, we have these monitors all around the newsroom. And I'd be working during the day and look up and I'd see this cute 
<laughs> show of people showing these funny videos and just sitting around talking and having a good time. That was your show. That was us, yeah. Uh, because we were a script station, and I think that's uh, EW Scripts was one of the owners of, yeah. of the show. Well, yeah, it was it kind of unique, actually, for the show is that we actually had three different station backers all exactly. at the same time. Mm, Cox and... Uh, one of the Raycom. 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 Yeah. We also at one time were owned by Raycom. Yeah. So I have ties to all these so these the t- corporate entities. That was great, but it was also the tough part was that when we lost, so we were kind of like a tripod. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in season eleven, um, one of the legs pulled out, and once it's gone, you just okay. Yeah, it's the business side of show business. It just uh, it happened like that in the blink of an eye. In the oh. um, it's uh, it happened in the space of about thirty six hours. It all just went. That was it. Oh my goodness! It happens quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, your your compadres, though your colleagues there on the show, you're all friends, and yeah, and they're most the of them thing. still in Phoenix, right? Yeah, they all still in the valley, um, bouncing around. We're all doing our own thing at the moment. I was saying, I was just talking to Nick from the show, seeing if we want to do a podcast together. But uh, is um, the, that is the toughest part, really? The show ending is just how much of a family that place was. I know people say that, but this one really was. I mean, yeah. of all the projects I've ever worked on, I've never experienced anything quite like it. Um, the studio when we were there pre-COVID. Um, was such a fun place. There was no hierarchy. So there was a hierarchy of work. There were producers and executive producers and hosts. And sure, editors yeah, and everybody has their role. But we were all just the same. We were all just goofed around. We had so much fun. We had parties at my house all the time with like 30, 40 people there. And we just, so that was the toughest part is the breaking up of the family. And mm-hmm. then it, especially us hosts, you know, people used to sort of write in or call in and just say, wow, you guys seem like you really like each other. They go, oh, it's because... We do. We hang yeah, out. That when kind we're of thing you show. cannot fake. You I, cannot. I know when you work with a co-anchor, you know, it's you don't fake that. Right. Sometimes um, you got to grin through it. But yeah, doing uh, doing right this minute was just hanging out with my mates all day. Yeah. Watching the Internet. So I was paid to do what everyone else got <laughs> I know. fired for doing. I, I, I knew enough about the show just watching it from my desk, looking up, going, they are having so much fun. Yeah, How do of, you get that gig? A lot of laughs. <laughs> uh, a lot of laughs, that one. Um and it was honestly, that was interesting for me because a lot of my shows had done, it would just been me. You yes. Know, so I, right. The lone yeah. ranger. So, so suddenly <laughs> so I'm speak. joining, uh, yeah, suddenly I'm joining on uh, a team of, you know, there's five of us um, at the table. And I was like, so, and that was a really interesting thing as well, because I've done every kind of show you can imagine up until coming to write this minute. And I, you know, I still had things to learn. That was what, mm-hmm. you know, I hit the ground running, but I was really, I was watching, you know, Beth, she was the original host and Nick, especially and watching okay how do you do this how do you tell these stories how do you okay all right all right and then I kind of put my own spin on it because we were kind of told don't look at the camera and uh, and I'm like no uh, that's what I always do that I like to bring the audience in so these yeah. things called a you know my some of my directors used to call it um pulling an ollie is when you kind of give a look to camera that makes everybody <laughs> laugh or yeah. um or right a, that little a, aside like bringing them in on the job exactly yeah. uh, or like um something else that say there's i'm always quite good at, at boiling down something very complicated into something very easy to understand mm-hmm. and i also would like to do that i'd pull the audience in and so it kind of changed the way the show was kind of done because the guys all started doing it so now we've got like a a fifth or sixth co-host being our audience and just involving them exactly and that's when it really kind of like started uh, connecting with people and we got some some great messages and some wonderful fans. They still message us saying we miss yeah. the show. I mean, I miss the show too. But, um, you know, all great things, you know, all good things come to an end. Yeah, yeah. And and some things can, can outlive their... Right. Their, so sometimes I, it, it, it all works out for the best. Huh? I mean, in the world of television and syndicated television, for a show like that, the little engine that could to last 11 seasons. That's remarkable. It's pretty wild. That is remarkable. Well, what you're doing now is so much fun. <laughs> and it was just sort of a top of mind here i am in texas experiencing things and that's what makes that englishman in texas so charming yeah it, i i really i appreciated just how it's connected um with texas i honestly you know it was a pretty tough time you know the shows ended yeah. it was a pretty stressful time selling our, our house in phoenix and relocating and the kids having to switch schools and so there was a lot how of, old are they now they're uh, they're both freshmen yeah they're, they're yeah. 14 15 that's a yeah, they so got I've, their friends. And right, it's exactly. Tough, yeah. And I've moved them around the world quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was a little bit of a loss of what to do. I was just kind of fixing up the house, um, getting it ready to, to move in. It was just a lot of eight hour days listening to podcasts and building things <laughs> and painting things. And it was the first time where I didn't really have a project to work on. So I just started making videos, you know, about Texas or about what I'm doing. And 
I just I did a video about eating a kalachi in in West, and it just blew up on TikTok. It had like three hundred and something thousand. <laughs> the views. first time you'd eaten one, or well, it was the, just it was talking about the first time I'd eaten one. Oh, okay. It was my first time at Slovacek's. Oh yeah. And um, I just did a video about oh, this is something. If you didn't know, West is this place that people come for kalachis. It was the yeah. first thing I did on the very first time I visited Texas, the very first time seventeen years ago. But it blew up, and so I'm like, well, I still know how to tell stories, and like it's. You know, online, people's attention span is about one and a half minutes to three minutes. And that's yeah, kind of the length. Yeah, you go length. longer. It's, yeah. But that's yeah. kind of the length of the story of right this minute. So mm-hmm. I'm like, well, this is what I do. So so I started just telling stories and they've really just started connecting. And so there's a few different things that I do now is that there's the experiential thing mm-hmm. where I'll go somewhere and say, oh, look at this place. There's the sort of like the the taste experiential, which is like going to try, try some drinks or a burger or a kalachi. And then I do these things as well, which are just my observations of Texans. And uh, those are the ones that have really sort of been connecting. Like I called them out. I did a video yesterday, which did pretty well, where I just called out Texas, where the tea being too sweet. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> and I, I, fact, I, com- as as I, I commented on it too. <laughs> <laughs> and I said... I said, uh, you you are right, no doubt. It's, well, that's the thing. There's a lot of people like they they go, okay, that's why I think that Texas has been so welcoming and adopted me is that they go, oh, y'all get us, like y'all yeah. understand. But <laughs> and it's always my mantra in television has also always been have fun, don't make fun. Yeah. Yeah. So like I don't like shows that you know make you cringe or shows that that ridicule. Um, and so my whole no, thing... No, and I think that's what people connect with. I right. mean, we we Texans don't feel like you're making fun of us. You're, oh, no. you're just with fresh eyes looking yeah. at what we take for granted. That's exactly it. It's exactly it, just like pointing something out that you guys do or say or how you do it. And people are like, oh, yeah, we do, oh, do that. Oh, Texasisms. Yeah. That's, and, I love Texasisms. We got started on that one as well. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got a whole bunch of stuff planned. i got the Texas Hello, the Texas Goodbye. Um, it's just like... <laughs> and then... The strange thing about it is, Anne, is like eight years on national television, you know, and syndicated 200 channels. We even went into to Cal- um, Canada. And I was, you know, I come back, I'd be around Waco. I got recognized maybe three or four times for the show. You'd be in HEB or something. Uh, ever since that Englishman in Texas, I get recognized literally every time I go out. I, every time I'm anywhere in Waco, I go to the grocery store, I'm checking out, I'm in another store. I mean, I walked into the, the pub the other day and some guy just pointed at me from across the bub, pub and went, Englishman! Englishman! And, there uh, you are. and I was like, well, okay, <laughs> this is kind of a thing. So I decided, you know, instead of just waiting around um, for another casting or, you know, mm-hmm. for a, a job to be working for someone else, I was like, well, why don't I take control of this and just start making this what I'm doing. I uh, recently just started monetizing it and I'm getting That's offers, great. offers from all over now. So I just opened, I put up a database online for people to fill in. And you wouldn't believe the places I'm being invited to now and the experiences to come out and do. And so now it's like... Right, and then have your that Englishman in... Yeah. Canada well, or whatever, that kind of thing. exactly where I hope in five years' yeah. time, that's where it is, yeah, to, to start... I could see a half-hour show. Englishman production company yeah. and it's that Englishman in. And just because yes. I, I was... My mum always sort of joked about it, like uh, I was born American. You yeah. know, it's just like I'm the British kid, uh, but born in Asia. But I grew up, I was always enamored with the States. You know, I've got my my pickup truck parked outside and my healer and I live in, in the country and I've got my, my cowboy hat. And it's yeah, like, yeah, your cowboy hat is well, well loved. <laughs> it's well a good used. one. I love that one. I it's found a it good by hat. accident in, uh, I was in Tombstone, Arizona. Yeah, tell that story. Yeah, well, I just love, you know, the, my wife and I as well, it's our favorite movie is tombstone yeah. and so it's what a it's what an, an amazing place to go and visit if you're ever in arizona highly recommend it because it feels like you've gone back in time you feel like you're in the wild west and i've never really been able to sort of pull hats off my wife she was the top model for 25 years she can put on a hat or a pair of sunglasses and looks amazing yeah so i saw this hat i plonked it on my son i still have the photo i was like i took a picture of him do you just say hey you and put this on and then i slipped it on my head i went oh no you and watch this hey zen and she goes you need to buy that hat. And I go, yeah, yeah, I know. I need to buy that hat. And I said, honestly, I understand why they do this. I was like, I can't believe I didn't do it for the previous six years of living in Arizona. Because as soon as you put it on, the temperature drops about 20 degrees. There's a reason oh, guys yeah. wear hats. I get it now. It's not just because they look cool. <laughs> they kind of are. But it's kind of become yeah. my thing now. So whenever I do a right this minute, sorry, um, a that Englishman in Texas video, you know, I'll wear the hat. So, mm-hmm. and then what I've recently been doing as well is using it because I can do accents. And so I, I can do the Texas accent. And it's okay. Like, so, yeah, and there are quite a few Texas accents. That's right. Well, that's, that's the There's one thing East I Texas. Found. Well, the thing is, this is the thing, Anne, right? People tell me this. I like, because I know, because in my wife's family, there's 
One brother, he's lit, stone even move. Like, no, that's that's, that's, all. Pre- that's pretty much Central Texas. And to me, you don't. You she's just got don't another brother that's all twang and he's up and down. And then my my wife is a very uh-huh. sort of straight up normal accent. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's four accents in their family alone. Yeah. So right. as much as people say, I think it's because Texans move around. Because I'm there, like you say, I'm out in state class here, I'm out of town, and I'm meeting people, and they're all from Waco. No one's accent is the same. I think it's literally just who your mother was, who you grew up with, or the shows you watched when you were growing exactly. up or listened to. And so, yeah, it's not like in the UK where every single town, village almost, has its own accent. Mm-hmm. And certain big cities, depending on how big they are, they have their own accents as well. So, you know, a South London accent, a North London accent, but you've got like, Birmingham's got the Brummie accent and Liverpool yeah, think and of the Newcastle. Beatles. <laughs> right. well, yeah, right. Liverpool. And, uh, Liverpool, yeah. And it's, uh, it's just, it's wild. So you always know where someone's from in the UK. Whereas, mm-hmm. yeah, here I... Haven't figured that out yet. I haven't quite figured that out, but I'll get there. <laughs> well, you're having a lot of fun with it, but uh, just tell them some of the numbers. I mean, it's it's incredible. The you'll you'll put up a, a video and just immediately have thousands. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did a video. I mean, uh, you know, I I did a video about Texas's biggest secret. It's the one they don't want to share with anybody else, and it's one of the favorite things of everybody. But it was about H E B. Mm-hmm. And I did an HEB video and that went over a million views. And just um, then once and I... And so you, you, we were, I think we were talking about HEB knows about... That's the thing, that? yeah. So yeah. I, I, you know... <laughs> I would think they would want to know about that. My numbers grew pretty quickly. Like, um, I'm, I think I'm up to about 40,000 on TikTok in just a couple of months. And you know, once I got to a point that I was able to then, oh, unlock monetization, there was this email waiting for me from HEB going, we really like your video. Can we sponsor you? I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Sure, can. yeah. So um, it's been great. Uh, I had my HEB socks on yesterday, actually, because they, they <laughs> sent me a gift basket. And then... Uh, and oh, there's then, some great, great oh, HEB amazing. swag. Yeah. And then... Uh, <laughs> But also just Texans as well, just going, oh, yeah, no, we love H-E-B. But also at the same time, as I like to do research and get, you know, maybe a little bit deeper into a story sometimes. And, you know, I like telling Texans something that they actually didn't realize. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, one, you'd be surprised how many people didn't realize that H-E-B doesn't go outside Texas. But then there are many people who think it's only in Texas, which isn't true. There's something like 200 locations in Mexico. It, really yeah in in mexico they, and just recently they were in dallas i mean they were yeah. not as far north as oh dallas. i remember when that was a big deal it was about the going. north as it, as it exactly. went you know i mean yeah. that's the thing so yeah but but in mexico yeah yeah so but again a lot of people didn't know that i did a video about the uh the official state motto of texas which kind of blew up on facebook i think it's about hundred thousand there but mm-hmm. it was one of those things that people didn't actually know what it was neither did i that's why i googled it and I was looking at it because a lot of people think it's like, come and take it, like the Alamo. No, or, no, no. Or that was a flag. Texas, that was a flag for right? revolution. And like, yeah, right. but you'd be surprised what even like Texas thought. And so when I sort of got it down to, well, it's actually friendship. Yeah, we're, we're the, friend, the friendly the, state. Right. But the mm-hmm. origins of that goes all the way back to the Caddo Nation, the native people who, you know, that was their word, was like, you know, their word for friendship. Which then the Tejanos came in and they sort of, they, 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 the Mexican. Mexicans or the Matajanos, and they, they pronounce it a different way. And then when the settlers came in, it became Texas. So the the way that it goes all the way back to is actually from the from the native word for friendship, which is why Texas is friendship. But that's exactly why I started doing the, the videos, actually, because Texas ends up in the news a lot, um, invariably for the wrong reasons. Well, even if it's like a true story. The things that get attention are always kind of the negative ones. That's sort of the nature of news, it's, though, I have to say. It is indeed. And so, you know, people will joke about Texas. I'm living here and I'm going, no, nah, man, people have got Texas wrong. It's, it's, you know, I've been all over the world. You know, I take this as someone that's been to like 50 countries and lived in four or five. Is that it's just about the friendliest place that I've ever been. You know, it's it's a very welcoming place. It's a very kind place. And also when people just see something that needs to be done or see someone in need, they just... Go over and help. Yeah, they and do. And so I felt like a little bit of a responsibility of, no, I can, uh, I'm going to tell the true story of Texas. And so the whole point of that Englishman is to, to, to bring people together. Because like you were just saying there with like news, is that everything in news and everything in media right now, I feel, has been um, finding a way to pull people apart. Yeah, divisive, yeah. You know, put put mm-hmm. people in team A or team B, uh, team no, red, team blue, or anything else there. And I was like, you know what? That's why that Englishman is deliberately apolitical it's about everything that we do agree on of, yeah. about about the beers and the hot dogs and the friday night lights and the rodeos and the fun the outdoors and the kalachis and you know where the best burger is and and the friendship and companionship so that's why you know i wanted to go out and try to do something good and uh, i think that's been connecting with people and it's I'm a big of, state 
with a it's with a, a big state. heart, and I, I I get to do twice a month a, a little feature for KXXV traveling Texas with Ann Harder, and I've gone to a lot of places, uh, things that were on my bucket list and mm-hmm. so forth. So I I've got a whole list of things to oh, <laughs> send great. your way, fun places to go and check out. Nine one one. What's your emergency? Do you hear that? It's coming from the house. It's coming from inside the house? Uh, do you mean, could it be? The Bolter House. New from Rogue Media, two haunted hotties talking about haunted places. Every episode, we dive deep into the darkest places and give you a bit of history. We're getting spooky in all the right places. You've gobbled your last ghoul. Follow along for the craziest and spookiest stories with Debbie's Dark Tourism. The Stanley Hotel, Winchester House, The Alamo, Hotel Monte Vista, and more spooky places. Find us at the underscore poltergals. P-O-L-T-E-R-G-A-L-S. Look over your shoulder. It's us, the Poltergals. Wherever you consume the podcast, you can find us there. Hi, this is Sarah. And I'm Carter. And this is Some of Our Thoughts. We're two Southern sommeliers, and we want to share everything we love and know about wine. We started hanging out during quarantine and cooking and drinking and listening to music, and we just thought this would be a great way to bring everything we know to you guys. We will make wine knowledge and food pairings easy and approachable. So put on your favorite vinyl, grab your favorite glass of wine, tune into our show, and let's have some fun. Wine Wine and vinyl. vinyl. (laughs) So check us out on roguemedianetwork.com or wherever you get your favorite podcast. We'll be talking about a lot. <laughs> frozen, frozen heroes. Gonna tell you about frozen, frozen heroes. Gonna tell you about. Hey, I'm Zach and I'm Mike, and we have a fantastic new podcast to tell you about. Bros, foes, and heroes. It's the two of us looking into the world of comics, breaking down some characters that you may have never heard of, and some that are just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, so Zach comes up with a character each time, and uh, I go into it just completely blind. I don't know who this person is or what their abilities are or anything, and and basically I guess we kind of go over their origin story and just some of the ridiculous stuff that maybe especially golden age stuff oh golden yeah. age stuff is always the best and we will make sure to highlight all of the shenanigans and just absolute weirdness yeah. of everything yeah, that's right so subscribe today and uh, follow us on instagram at bros bros heroes and if you don't i know where you live not really but please subscribe <laughs> bros and bros and heroes Gonna tell you about pros and foes and heroes. Gonna tell you about. I really want to, you know, honestly, do want to make this the thing that I'm doing for my for my job. Um, because like you said, it is a huge place. There is a lot to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lots of stories to tell. I really do want to get out and explore the state and yeah. get out to like, I was down, um, you know, I always feed it out into the comments, you know, let me know somewhere to go. Let me know, you know, a place that would be fun to visit. And one of the ones that came out was during uh, during the ice storm. They were all trapped at home. So I did a live video on Facebook and I said, look, just for fun, uh, I know you guys like doing this kind of thing. Send me the names of Texas towns and I'll, I'll try and pronounce them because mm-hmm. there's some really weird ones here. Yes, there are. And uh, one of the ones that got sent was um, one Andice, right? Uh-huh. It's a teeny tiny town of about 25 people. It's about 60 miles from here. Yes. And uh, But as soon as someone put that comment, there were three comments that came up back to back to back saying, oh, best burger in Texas, best burger in Texas. They've got this tiny little place. It's literally the only store, the general store 
in in the middle of town. So it was like last week. I said to my missus, it was a Wednesday, and it was noon. I said, "Honey, do you want to?" She just road trip down to Andice and try their burger, and that's you know I made a video out of it, and it's of course. When you say, well, is this the best burger in Texas? You get 700 comments going, <laughs> actually, this is the best burger no, in no, Texas. No, 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 yeah, yeah. You want to come visit this place. But that's yeah. exactly what I'm looking for because it's mm-hmm. very much crowdsourced because my experience of Texas is, um, you know, I've been lucky enough. I've been a little bit to Dallas. I've done a fair few visits to Austin. Mm-hmm. I love San Antonio. The Riverwalk is a place oh, that's very close to my yeah. heart. I've done a couple of different trips down there. I barely know Houston. At all. I mean, I I went to the Texans stadium once because one of my uh, my brothers in law was a coach for a team that went to state. So we're mm-hmm. all at the game watching the state game, oh, which yeah. is you know quintessentially Texas experience. But I've sure. never actually <laughs> been into the city. I've just yeah. experienced the Ring Road, which is a nightmare. Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that loop is it is a monster. Is it is terrifying. Some, is something? Yeah, yeah. Houston, Houston's a. It's it's got its own vibe. I mean, they're very very different than Dallas, and oh, and yeah. of course Dallas very different than Fort Worth. I mean, it's it's interesting how the big cities. So, w- what kind of vibe would you say Waco has? It's so different. I mean, the thing is, and seventeen years ago when I first came out, you know, it was, you know, Waco still had that that reputation, had the the, the story we'd all been watching when we'd been younger, and it had been on the news, and it's like it oh, feels yeah. like. It had been bleeding into the background. And, oh, it was like a place. I remember, you know, I would go watch Baylor at the old stadium, mm-hmm. you know, back when Baylor just lost all the time. <laughs> and it was just like, <laughs> oh, yeah, live through wanna, all those days. Do you want to come watch Baylor lose? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, why I'll watch not? Baylor lose. Of and course. Eat some popcorn. Um, <laughs> but, like, it's it was around the time. I remember I was here um, for a while, and it was just during the resurgence of the Baylor team. I went down to watch the Alamo Bowl uh, mm-hmm. in San Antonio when RG3 was quarterback. Yeah. I saw that game. You know, I was. Yeah screaming my, my lungs out watching them sure. play but then it was around that time so money comes in because of that you get the new stadium and just the way that that waco has glowed up in the last eight years is, is incredible yeah, um it like, truly is especially in the last like three years really i mean apart like the pandemic certainly you know put a damper on things for a while but i used to say to wake call waco to other people and i go it's the on the way to city you were on the way to Dallas. You were on the way to San Antonio. Exactly. You were on the way to Austin. You drove through Waco. Whereas now Waco is a place where people are coming. You know, mm-hmm. people are choosing to move here. People are choosing to come here for events. You've got food truck festivals and Dia de los Muertos and movie festivals and all this other stuff that's going on. That Waco's now got its own sort of vibe. You know, depending on where you are, downtown, you've got this sort of little mini Austin feel you yeah. know you got that little that little vibe but then you get down sort of by the river in Cameron Park you got that like oh I'm still in the country so it's like the other cities feel like a city whereas Waco still feels like the country if you know what I mean like you can yeah I mean I live technically in the country you but, are in the country in Lorena you know, yeah. 10 10 minutes and uh, I'm I'm in Hewitt which is basically now it's all grown Waco's grown yeah, past it's all have, one of the same thing yeah things have really grown but, uh, but even Lorena I mean I remember a day you know I'm back in the day when it was just all fields and now yeah. it's there's all this development these yeah, new lots housing of houses projects going, going up and it's it's just growing growing booming and expanding and I think Waco really quite interestingly has become that place to be there's a lot going on and i think if you you have something you want to do or you want to grow or open something i think waco is the place to do it right now and it's an easy place to live very it really is yeah it is like very it's easy to get around you don't have to mm-hmm. deal with like the um the traffic of austin um mm-hmm. the sheer scale of dallas fort worth you know where it's just like where are we going it's going to take an hour wherever we're going yeah no matter what yeah, yeah. Where, whereas here it's like you know the 10 15 minutes yeah. you always budget 15 maybe 15 minutes, minutes. Yeah, yeah i'll be there and you don't have to really worry <laughs> i mean like I remember during Christmas, my father-in-law was like, wow, traffic downtown was just so bad. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, it took two goes to get through a red light. And I that's, oh, that's yeah. most cities in the world. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> but in Waco, yeah, oh, we, my, we feel put upon. Yeah. A little put upon if you have to wait through twice. I'm at Lake Air trying cycle, to turn yeah. left, and it's taken forever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I knew we were going to have a lot of fun, and this we've we've gone longer than I normally do. And I know you've got other things. You had some big fish to fry this afternoon. You just have jumped in with both feet here. Oh, I'd, I'd stick around for you three got, hours. You if got you it. Want. Well, I got well all I would stories lo- to tell. I I know there's so much more, and we'll just have to do this again. I mean, Anytime. that's the only. But I do like to end these with a a little questionnaire that uh, the late great James Lipton would do on Inside the Actor's Studio. Oh, it's cool. Sort of his sort of his take on this <laughs> is what I have. What is your favorite word? Oh, that's, oh, that, I usually talk about that. Oh, no. I'm going to, it's, I love words that just sound good onomatopoetically as well. But like That's that, a good word right there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, onomatopoetic is a very fun word to say. Um, translucent. 
That's a good way to That's say it one. as well. Uh, yeah, I'm, let's go with onomatopoetically. I like, okay, I like yeah. throwing that one out. At that as opposed to anti-disestablishmentarianism, which is so, very long. Is that your least favorite then? What no, is your least favorite word? Spell. <laughs> yeah, I, don't ask my, me. My, the least favorite word as a younger person was yacht because I couldn't spell it. The Y A I used to have to say yacht. Yeah. It's like I lived in Awatuki in, in Phoenix, but I'd have to say Ahwatuki so I knew how to actually spell it. How does how to, how to spell it? <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually or emotionally? It's, um, you know, I was just talking about this yesterday with people is honestly, as much as I do, like, you know, my own thing, it's collaboration. I'm very collaboratively yes. creative. I'm looking, that's what I'm doing right now is trying to find sort of the, the that Englishman team, some people that I can work with, because some of the best ideas come by bouncing an idea off somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to, so a friend of mine used to say it, the guy that actually taught me TV when he first hired me, but. You know, he's like, I stare at a blank piece of paper and I'll stare at it forever. But if you draw a line on it, I'll finish the picture. And that's kind of like, you know, one thing that I do is I'm quite uh, reactionarily funny. You know, that's why I write this minute work. I'm quite quick on my feet. I've got quite quite a quick wit. But if no one's really saying anything, you know, you've got to fill just the dead air. But if other people are saying stuff, I'll finish their sentences for them. It'll yeah. remind me of an interesting fact. And then suddenly you're jamming and you're you're off on some other random tangent. But that's where the entertainment comes in. Yeah. So it's collaboration is what I really really gets me going well then what turns you off creatively or spiritually it's been honestly it's pretty hard um it's only when i'm just like completely because my brain is sometimes just constantly going and there's almost I can tell. <laughs> too many ideas and yeah. honestly some friends of mine like adrian dave's wife she's been the one that's really been helping me sort of focus my ideas and you know uh, realize them visually on a board she's great at yeah that. she's fantastic she um, really is she has a bit of a ninja she's like you yeah know, my unofficial, <laughs> that, that, that's a good description my unofficial <laughs> consultant she's, she's really been, been on helping. this show too <laughs> but she yeah it's that's what really gets me is that when i it's just um you know, I'm too overwhelmed with the ideas and I need to marshal them and sort of put mm -hmm. them out. But but nothing really turns me turns me off of the, the creative thing. I love to do things like this. I, I love uh, to do radio. I was just on NPR this morning helping mm -hmm. them with their drive. And I, I love to create something that, that people find entertaining. I love to entertain. You know, when people come up and just go, oh, I really like your content or I really love your show. I'm like, thanks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting it. It's, exactly. I just want people to have a good time. Right, right. Um, what sound do you love the most? I'll tell you, actually, um, recently, because it's I've been spending a lot of time outside. Um, you know, when you've got some some land, finally, mm -hmm. and when we lived in Phoenix, it was, you know, concrete jungle, building, building right next to us, right. tiny little yard, you know, asphalt outside. It always felt really hot. Is um, It's just sitting outside and I've got it's um, the trees in the wind. It's just so relaxing. I've got these beautiful um, wind chimes as well. Oh. So I sit out on the day. But honestly, if you're ever watching any of that Englishman videos that I'm recording at home, you'll always hear the in the background. Ding, 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 ding. Um, but that is the one that I realized I missed because when I was in Phoenix, my buddy Nick from the show, we'd often go camping together because Arizona has some great camping. But you have to drive a couple of hours to be mm -hmm. able to see the stars and sit among the sort of the nature. Whereas I'm like, now I just go outside my door and sit yeah. outside and... I was sitting Maybe next to my hear a cow pit. mooing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, and then you get all the coyotes yipping and howling. Oh, yeah. And then my dogs are like, wait, 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 wait do, we, do we howl? <laughs> I feel like I should howl right now. Like, Let, let's howl. Okay, let's, let's howl. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's what I found is like I've been trying to find my peace again because, yeah. uh, you know, I was really, right this minute was great, but I only had 10 days off a year for the first five years. You were blowing and going. Man. And, uh, yeah, so I, I genuinely, I mean, during COVID, um, realized I was burnt out. I yeah. was burning out. I uh, hadn't had enough time. I wasn't looking after myself. I wasn't just, it was all work. And so w something I've been recently trying to do is just bring more peace to my life and just spend a moment and read a book, um, you know, and just sit outside. And fortunately, Texas is a beautiful place to sit outside. <laughs> That's a great way to recharge. Um, what sound do you hate? Oh, what sound do I hate? You know, I mean, part of me would say the sound of a city, but Sometimes that is also that that white noise mm -hmm. is actually, you know, because I'm from, I came from Hong Kong, a place where there was always sound. Probably a constant rumble. I tell you that, I tell you the one, okay, so one sound I did hate is I'm, my wife and I went, um, we stayed in Hong Kong. We were on a sort of three month modeling assignment. We got put in a tiny little modeling apartment and um, 
Hong Kong is very close together. Okay, it's it's like the New York of Asia. And uh, the day we got there, they started demolishing the building attached to us. Oh my gosh! So, <laughs> I had a bottle of water. I remember that's the first exciting. Morning, and it goes ding 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 and falls off, off. the table. Oh gosh! But you'd be surprised that like within four days, you didn't hear it. You just tuned it out. And you're watching television. I remember this. I was watching TV and my wife comes in and suddenly the drilling stops and we realize that the television is on 99. It's really yeah. loud. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, what am I, am I doing? Good luck. <laughs> quick, 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 so, quick, quick. yeah, at the moment, I think it's just a bit of chaotic noise. but um, <laughs> Or just uh, my children being upset. Don't like that noise. Yeah, I've yeah. heard that from wanna, other people. My kids are fighting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, my children, actually, they're angels. Oh, well, I know. Yeah, I'm during, sure. I know for real. Like yeah, during they, COVID, yeah, yeah. with that, not one slam door, not oh, one screaming great. match, no grand. They they understood the assignment and they they understood we were on Bless spaceship pedigree. Yeah, and we're going to get through this. And they yeah. were an absolute treasure. I'm my children are a, a blessing in yeah. so many ways. Yeah. I was never that well behaved as a child. <laughs> they do not get it from me. That's all I know. <laughs> what What other profession would you like to try? Um. Or have tried. I was until that gap year mm -hmm. where I accidentally got into modeling, accidentally got into a movie and decided, oh, this is fun. I had been actively meeting with the RAF liaison officer. I wanted to be a fast mm. jet pilot for the RAF. I've been an aviation enthusiast since I was a child. One thing my, my wife kind of likes, she, you know, it's a little bit nerdy for her, but she likes it. But, you know, whenever I see um, an aircraft, I usually know what it is. You sure. Know, so I know, okay, you know, I can see off in the distance. I go, oh, that's an AH-64D longbow. That's the Apache with the radar wow. thing on top. And so my my neighbor, James, um, he's a huge uh, nerd when it comes to planes. In fact, he's in the uh, the, the the commemorative Air Force. Mm -hmm. So he looks after a B-25. Um, so he took me up to Wings Over Dallas. I was, we, unfortunately, I was making a video. It's a pretty, it's one of my favorite videos, actually, because it's a very real one, but we were there for that um, the mid-air disaster that happened. It was really, I have waited my entire life. So the B-17 and the Spitfire are my two favorite planes of all time. Um, I can tell the sound of a Spitfire with my eyes closed. and uh, But I'd never been able to see a B-17 fly. And I was like a 10-year-old. I was so excited. I was on the edge of tears and I had goosebumps. And then for that tragedy to happen at the same time yeah. was uh, really... Um, hit me right in the gut actually and I was making a video about it and I decided that I was going to tell the true story so I edited the video exactly as the experience was so it's a really really happy video up until the moment and because everybody else is doing the story about the crash so I figured well I'm going to do the story about what it was like to be there to be there to yeah, experience it was that. really tough mm, that was. Mm, mm. what job do you know you would not ever want to do I could never do what my wife does. Um, she's recently, numbers and databases terrify me. Give me a microphone, put me on stage in front of 15,000 people with no script and go, Ollie, you need to fill time for 20 minutes. I'd much rather do that, right? That's something that basically is a nightmare for, for everybody else on the planet. Is sure, yeah, speaking. that's public speaking, yeah. Yeah, so my wife, she just, uh, she's now sort of gone out on her own, like she started her own bookkeeping uh, mm -hmm. company. Actually, if anybody's looking for bookkeeping services, Oleander Bookkeeping right there. But because I told her, I said, Zen, you don't realize how much numbers like this give people anxiety. Yeah. It gives people, and she takes joy from it. She sees it as a puzzle that needs to be solved. There is nothing more satisfying satisfying for her than to press the button and it reconciles to 0, 0.00. Wow. And she'll just come in and she's doing a dance. I did it. Yeah, I well, that, that for me <laughs> is if you wanted to sort of torture me and find out where the rebel base was, if this was Star Wars, it'd be like, do some bookkeeping. I go, <laughs> oh, they're on Yavin 4. Just go get them. <laughs> Reconcile this account yeah, right no, now. That's not for me. So yeah, that's, <laughs> All right. that's but that's why I think we work so well as a couple. Is yeah. that we uh, we work we're very very similar, but we're also complete opposites at the same time. Yeah, you complement one another. Yeah, beautiful. She's a yeah. my team, my teammate in mm. everything. Mm -hmm. Finally, what do you want to hear God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? Not you. <laughs> <laughs> or he goes hey you know what you made some pretty funny stuff i mean honestly i try to live as a good person yeah you know i i do i try to bring joy into people's lives um i try to be positive i try to find the positive in everything so yeah and maybe it's just welcome in you know that would be quite nice well you are a joy <laughs> ali Thanks, it's been so much fun i knew that we would we just hit it off because you are you are such a genuine talent and uh, just do hitting all the right buttons right now i appreciate you saying so yeah. and it was a really pleasure to come in seriously i'm saying anytime you want i'd, I'd love to come in if you have other well we've other got guests. so much more we could talk about oh 100 like i said we barely even <laughs> scratched the surface oh ollie pedigree that 
Englishman. Yep, that Englishman in Texas. Texas. Yeah, in Texas. Look me. for the black hat, and and they can find you. That, yep. I mean, that's your handle. TikTok, uh, Instagram, and then if you look up that Englishman in Texas or Ollie Pettigrew, you'll find my Facebook page as well. I put the videos out there, and I'm about to uh, also start putting out some longer form videos on on YouTube and things like that. Very good. All the best to you, Ali. Thank you so thank much. You so much, and thank you for being with us. Join us again. Bye bye. Central Texas Life with Ann Harder is part of the Rogue Media family. Be sure to check out our other shows at roguemedianetwork.com. Please rate this show five stars on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Join us again soon for more Central Texas Life with Ann Harder.